Hello, welcome to Show Studios Live panel discussions. In these discussions, experts from all part of the industry discuss and debate the most important fashion weeks of the season. Today, in the midst of Milan Fashion Week, we're going to be discussing Marnie's Spring Summer 22 collection. My name is Joshua James Small. I'm a sustainable women's wear designer, freelance writer, and model with Fast Model Management. And I will hand you over to my panel, starting with Patrick to introduce themselves. Hey everyone, I'm Patrick McDowell. I'm a sustainable fashion designer based in London. Jeannie? Hi, I'm Jeannie. I'm the creative director of a magazine called Perfect. And Harry? Hi, I'm Harry Freegard. I am a designer and director with really terrible lighting. Perfect. <laughs> right, so um, the Marnie show was last Saturday, which is the 25th of September. Um, I'm going to run around and see everyone's quick thoughts, um, if there was anything that stood out to you that you want to discuss, and then if not, I have um, a little bit of context that I'd like to go over. So what is everyone's initial thoughts? We'll go around from Patrick Jeannie to Harry. Crafty. Crafty. Um, I was going to say emotional. Okay. I would say Maybray. All I saw was just Maybray. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, I mean, there was a strong emphasis on sustainability. Um, the collection was quite heavy in looks. Um, over everyone that was, so this is context for everyone at home. So all of the guests were dressed in upcycled looks from years previous. Um, and they kind of fell into sync with the models themselves. Um, so you had kind of this theatrical interplay between the audience and the models themselves. Um, the actual show runtime, I think, was something like 40 minutes. So it's quite a long show. Um, there were performances by Mickey Blanco. Um, and then there was a singer called Zelsa, I think. Um, she performed in between. So there were um, a number of different, um, I suppose, acts to, to this show um, in and amongst the collection itself. Um, was there anything that stood out to either of any of you? Um, I thought the casting was really interesting, just kind of like load a, a real mix and like variety of different people um, who work in different disciplines. I thought that was really interesting, sort of giving the clothes a bit more context and, you know, not just having your everyday model, even though models aren't everyday, you know, more per, yeah. as per usual. Absolutely. <laughs> To Jeannie's point as well, like the casting was fabulous. To have so many people that, you know, have a personal relationship with uh, Rizzo, you know, they had Camilla and Julia Venturini from the Medea sisters walking her, his dear friends. And we had Jess Mabry coming back again and, and Walter Pierce walked it himself, which was fabulous. The casting was great. Yeah, it was amazing. Did you like that the audience were dressed equally? Did you like that like interplay between the two or did you think that it detracted away from the show itself? I think it made it, 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 for me, it was a bit, it, it was like an extension of a fashion show, which I think is quite exciting now, this kind of new iterations of shows. And this definitely feel like I had more substance and to like involve the audience in that way. It was, I mean, initially I found it a little bit confusing. So I was like, why is everyone kind of in the same, you know, usually you've got like fashion black on the, on the seats, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really enjoying seeing kind of the ways people are approaching shows now. It's kind of nice to see something a bit more engaging. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think um, I agree with the previous point in terms of casting. I think it was great. I think it was um, a nice, diverse casting. I'm seeing that a lot more in a number of different shows across the season and not just in Milan, in London also, um, and New York, which is great to see. Um, so I think it's less of a trend, more of just the way that the industry is going now, which is great because it seems a bit more organic as opposed to like, uh, like tricks and, and, and like marketing stunts of like including someone here, there and everywhere. Did you think it was organic the way that the, the show was cast? Do you think it was, um, or do you think it was more to, to tick block boxes since you were both? I, I think it certainly felt organic. I think everything about that was organic having all these people dressed in the same clothes rather than it just being if it were just the models walking up and down in looks that were so crafty would it feel a bit meager you know to have everyone there it felt organic everyone's wearing the clothes it feels that's what people do they wear clothes it's not just models up and down wearing fashion looks people wear clothes they go places in those clothes and that's what these people are doing it was more real 
Uh, do you know what? I think that really is a really good segue because basically, so um, this morning I reached out to um, Francesco uh, Risso, who is the creative director of Marnie this morning. I had a discussion with him about the show itself. Um, and it was really interesting how he described, uh, like he put show in, in quotation marks for me um, and talked about um, in the years of fashion performing, so emphasis on the word performing, this idea that fashion has become this performance. Um, and he um, talked, discussed in depth about the gap between the mason and the people who wear the poetry. So this, this distance between um, the designer themselves and the people they are dressing. And I think this show is a really good example of the, that reclaiming that space so that you have that interaction between designer and the model themselves. So the person you are dressing is directly involved in the design of the piece. Do you think that's important when we um, are thinking about clothes or do you think that, that this way of fashion where the brand is dictatorial and dictates what someone should wear, what do you think is more important in today's world? I think it feels, that feels a little bit more realistic because I just think at a time now you want to, everybody wants to kind of buy things and be part of things that feel like them and represent them um, wholeheartedly. So why would you not extend that to sort of fashion um, in general? Mm. Uh, so I think, no, uh, so I, I think it's less alienating as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm a split. I can see. I think the show was great. I think the idea, because the amount of people that they dress, the the attendees, in fact, I think overshadows the show itself in the best way possible. Because they dressed 400 people in um, in upcycled looks. I mean, that is quite a feat in itself. That is incredible and the fact that they were upcycled and recycled pieces um and every each and every one of the attendees was asked into the atelier the week before to fit their look and that interaction between the audience and the person wearing that that, that piece they weren't like models they weren't um they wasn't designed for uh, like a public publicity stunt it was very much these pieces were tailored and crafted to the people wearing them and as far as i'm aware the attendees were then able to keep these archive pieces afterwards because they'd been tailored to their bodies and reworked for them as individuals um do you think that 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 integration between the wearer and the designer and the wearer dictating what they want is important going forward in this industry. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, that was I a bit loaded question. <laughs> so do you think, what, 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 in, in the context, when you think about all the other shows that we've had, and especially post-COVID when everyone is embracing um, escapism and this heightened reality that is, is very um, adjacent to what, what a normal clothes or atypical normal clothes are or normal attire is do you think that people want something that is functional wearable and um, suited to them or do you think people want to see something and buy into something that's aspirational um, I think people want to feel more like an individual as humanly possible now um, I think Covid's kind of I hate droning on about it but it's kind of given everybody a, a moment to stop and to think and to reassess how how they are and how they behave and how they see themselves and I think clothes are a representation of that so you're kind of you're, you're making purchases and thinking how is this going to make me feel like the best version of me rather than I'm buying into this because I want this to represent me I, I think that's kind of a, an old and, and tired method um yeah interesting I mean, I'm going to segue and ask you, Harry, directly, because I know that um, I've seen a number of different looks that you wear yourself and they're not, I suppose, atypically what everyone else would wear. Do you think it's, do you think, I mean, I mean that in the best way possible, but, um, <laughs> but, but do you, would, would you say that, um, in your opinion, do you think that we, sh that this move to functionality and, um, for lack of a better word, mundane clothing, very, very simple. Do you think that's um, a sad move or do you think that's just a sign of the times? As someone who wears something um, I, more ext extrovert? It's certainly a sign of the times. I think it's certainly a pivot that is welcomed. I think it's fantastic. For the luxury consumer, obviously it's Marnie, great. But I do wonder how this will affect high streets. Will they be simulating this kind of, uh, you know, it's bespoke, it's upcycled, it's all of this. Fabulous for the Marnie buyer, love that. But will this affect, you know, high street people, high street chains to be trying to churn out simulated versions of this kind of bespoke 
found peace and then it's going to will it will it be diluted by that fact you know right now it's these niche little bespoke items that are delicious and gorgeous and few and far between mm. will we in six months time see this just kind of i don't know watered down by those trying to replicate it that's what i'm wondering yeah i mean that's quite interesting and also it segues over i mean i'm going to jump into you patrick because i know that you obviously do your work with pinko where you rework archive pieces and I could see that that is perhaps leads into what you were saying, Harry, in that how, how will this idea of upcycled garments and, and recycled pieces translate to a more commercial market? So to put the question to you, Patrick, how, will, how do you think that that will translate to a more commercial market, both in high-end and um, accessible sectors of the industry? Do you think that's something that's feasible? Uh, yeah, completely. It just it takes that business, whichever business, it, all businesses just have to rethink their approach to things and have to understand that perhaps quantities are lower. Um, we've seen at PINCO that actually, um, uh, similarly, I think to, to all of us, we're, the customers are wanting things that are more interesting and more uh, individual and you know, the, the more generic things aren't, aren't the ones that are selling anymore. So um, personally, I welcome that. You know, I think it's really nice for, for a customer at any price point to be able to feel like they've got something that they identify with and something that they've invested in that feels special to them. And perhaps that piece is slightly more expensive than what they'd usually spend at that brand. But um, it seems like people are wanting to to buy that piece now instead of kind of another like brand t-shirt or something and um for me that's fab i think it's a really nice thing you know i've even noticed it myself i'm really enjoying experimenting with my own clothing now and i'm just so happy to be back out doing things in person again that it's so nice to have fun with the clothes that i'm wearing whilst i'm doing that and and like exploring my own style because I think really I think it's so easy to to play it down but we really were kind of just like at home for, for like a year you know and that's actually quite quite a long time so I think it's it's so amazing to see this like expression of people's individuality now yeah I mean I, I mean as a fellow sustainable fellow sustainable designer I kind of agree that it can be done so what you were saying harry and that like i think it can be translated into a commercial space i just don't know how long i don't think anyone knows how long that can go on for because obviously there's only so much stock that we can upcycle until we need new um so i think it is but it's great to see a larger brand doing it but like you said patrick it's nice to see creativity which links into what i wanted to talk about in terms of the show itself take away from the um, aside from the sustainable aspect of it, the actual presentation, what did we all think of that? For me, personally, I thought it, it mirrored a lot of um, like Charles Jeffrey-esque um, playfulness in, in, the, in the way that it was framed with the poetry, um, the musical number in between. Um, and like I talked to Iolo of High Fashion Talk this morning, and um, he was saying about how it, it kind of echoed uh, Kanye's Sunday service because of the choir and the, and the way you had this kind of ceremonial um, collection or co collective of people um, in this very uh, cult-like uh, area. But I mean, what do we all think of the way it was uh, shot and, and presented? Do we like it? Do we have any thoughts on it? Do we see any similarities? Were you bored of how it was, how it was done? I wouldn't say bored. I thought it was a bit dark, but nothing against that. Um, I think it's nice to have a bit of injection of this. I think that's something that Milan is missing. I think it's bringing a bit of that youth fun. It's, you know, it's not a raised catwalk. Well, perhaps it is in the centre. But, um, you know, it, it feels less generic. That I think Milan needs a bit of spice in that sense. Did you think it translated well to live stream, though? Because this is something I discussed with quite a lot of people, in that the, the idea of actually being there was probably much better than watching it on a live stream because for me personally, it was like a 50, 60 minute live stream and a lot of it was quite darkly lit. You couldn't really see too many of the clothings. And I think the 
I think the idea and the inclusion of all of those people in that space was wonderful. And I think to be there, it would have been a great experience, but I'm not sure that that experience translated through live stream. Did you lot think the same or did you have, did you really enjoy watching it live or? It did feel a bit like you were queuing to get into a party. <laughs> Lots of backs. Yeah. What did you think, Jeannie? Well, I think it was fun. <laughs> Um, when I think when it finally kind of it kicked off, it was it was really interesting. But it's yeah, I agree with you. It's quite if you don't sort of know what's going on, it's quite hard to sort of watch that for twenty minutes before the show sort of actually starts. Um, but then I think that's just the, that's kind of the problem with live streams in general. Yeah, I mean, in my I mean, I, I think that um, filmed experience or experiences of the laptop are better when they are filmed and edited like a film than a live stream themselves because you get the full creative um but the full idea of the creative themselves um to its fullest through collaboration with photographers and all that sort of thing when it's live stream it's kind of like a dare i say afterthought um yeah but, but i think that's a really good point because like does everything need to be live streamed like why can't it be like a video afterwards that comes out like the next day or even like a few hours after like, I think it's a really good point, actually, because sometimes it's like, if you're always trying to make everything visible for everyone, like, inevitably, that's, there's, it's not going to work completely on either end, right? So I think, it, like, there was a really, I think it was the Versace show, they did, like, extra video backstage that was more, like, real TikTok-ish type, not like that, but more like a fashion version of that, that they then like edited into runway stuff and put that out afterwards, which I thought was quite nice. I mean, obviously they do more of a traditional like catwalk kind of thing, but I think possibly not everything actually has to be live streamed. Mm. Just my opinion. <laughs> I agree with that about not everything must be live streamed, but I also do wonder this kind of undoneness of the live stream, is that just all encompassing? Is that part of the whole aura of the show? The live stream was a bit clunky and shit and it kind of went with everything being undone and mashed up and smashed together. Perhaps that's the genius. Does everything have to be content and processed and turned into a video churned out and turned into a 60 second clip and in 10 different formats? Maybe it was supposed to be a bit shit and fabulous. I enjoyed. <laughs> no, I no, I agree. I think that's a really good point. I couldn't help but think this afternoon that I like the idea that a show doesn't need to necessarily be filmed or live streamed, that you could just have these moments like you did pre-millennium where people weren't looking for a, a, a shot to put on Instagram, but that perhaps we'll see, as because as, there's a trend at the moment for people to be offline, it, it's very trendy for people to be like, to leave social media entirely and just be very present in the real world. And I thought that perhaps it would have been a nicer idea not to live stream it, just to let the echoes of the people that were there discussing it travel. Do you know what I mean? Just instead of having the, uh, like a, like a, like, for lack of a better word, a shit live stream, instead of having a shit live stream, just have, um, have whatever material they wanted to release as a studio that they felt was high quality and represented the craft that they put into it and then just let the people that were there because there were like i said there were 400 people that were dressed in that's it, a large amount of people when you think about their influence just let their echoes of their stories of the show trickle down like i think that would have been a nicer uh, a, 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 the way i put it in my notes was like an unreplayable moment because at the moment we, we just felt we film shows and we have these like um filmed sections where we, we just want clips like you said 60 second clips harry that you that people want to reshare and um repost and get interaction out of and wouldn't it be nice just to have a show where the emphasis which this show was so much emphasis on craft and then just take it back to this natural section where um people weren't looking for likes and shares they were just wanting to create a show to create a moment for people to enjoy and move on to the next do you know what i mean because at the end of the day shifting this conversation into commerciality the pieces weren't heavily commercial there weren't if, when you look at it it wasn't a heavily commercial show so it's not like they're going to use much of this matter to sell product i mean the accessories in my opinion were quite strong so i imagine they'll sell quite a lot of those but the clothes themselves were very disheveled and weren't entirely wearable commercial pieces so it's like where where like they could have just left it as this this thing this entity rather than having to create moments from live streams and footage what did you guys think about the actual like clothes themselves 
I commend his bravery in doing, in as you said, in doing these kind of uh, your to use your word dishevelled. Um, it, it's a big, it's a big powerhouse of a brand, isn't it? It's Marnie to then send out a bunch of uh, hacked up jumpers. It's a lovely, brave move, and I commend that. Yeah, I mean, Jeannie, I'd be quite interested because you're a stylist. So I'd be, I'd be, like, how do you feel looking at the collection and picking it apart? Do you think it was a successful collection or do you think, like, I mean, you don't have to consider commerciality just in considering the silhouettes themselves. Do you think it was a successful collection or do you think it was just a bunch of rags? <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of rags. Um, I really loved lots of it. I loved some, I loved those like elongated sleeves and like the really sort of like, big silhouettes those you know the giant bits of knitwear and stuff like that that was really nice I loved the like patched together flowers to make some little bra tops and matching skirts and um it was all very I just thought it was really sweet and like quite optimistic um and sort of made me feel really warm and fuzzy and I was like oh that's really nice um which is a rarity these days because we're also focused on like getting back to business and getting back to normal. And it was really nice to see sort of just a celebration of clothes and people rather than um, something so honed in. Um, but yeah, there's lots of like sheet worthy pieces as well. So it was, yeah, yeah, I thought it was like a good mix. Yeah, I know. I agree. I think it was like the craftiness. I'm just going to interject with a little um, bit of info. So basically the, the, the stripes, so this is how Vogue put it, um, which is, very, 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 very good written, but um, in terms of their, their use of literature, but they put stripes are associated with direction, whereas daisies are new beginning and resilience. Um, and when I, I think that um, uh, Risso was interviewed for, for this piece on Vogue and he uh, classed them as banal con concepts, which is quite a harsh, um, interesting level of self-awareness in that he knows that they're very cliched, um, visual motifs i suppose um but i do quite like in a, a take or take away the cringy clichedness of them i think it is quite a nice collection post this this whole weird year that we've had it's a, like a level of optimism in its most pure state really isn't it mm. and, to, and to see like the craft because i mean there was one there was a skirt right at the end i can't remember which look it was of all the flowers which were like patchworked on on top of each other yeah. i mean it is it is reminiscent of like kids kids in college you know what I mean just like sticking pieces together it's very interactive you can see the craft and you can see that people have like worked into it. obviously it's much more finesse than that um that description but you can see what I'm trying to get at is that you can see the craft and the level of work that's gone into it um and do you think that's important when it comes to clothing now or do you would you have preferred to see something finesse Anyone. We've got enough finesse. We've got so much finesse. Yeah. We've got finesse by the bucket load. We've got one designer in Milan doing anything like this. Let's <laughs> let's clap for that. I think no more finesse. I'm sick and tired of it. <laughs> Everything is really, really shiny. So it's yeah, it's quite nice to just see things feel a bit more organic. Mm. And to Jeannie's point earlier about how um, everyone's so obsessed about getting back to it and getting back to work and how this is, this is maybe we do need to lie around in fields and wear daisies a little bit longer. Maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe that was the right idea. I do not, I fully agree. I think it was a nice break as well, especially after seeing, because obviously Milan is after London and New York, especially after seeing see, like show after show after show of polished looks. There weren't that, like you said, there, weren't, there aren't that many designers that do these disheveled kind of like, art school-esque kind of pieces um, and even if they do they normally get pushed into an area where they have to be commercial so it's quite nice to see someone that has done commercial pieces just throw that to the wind and, uh, and say hey let's just do crafted crafty pieces upcycled pieces that are um, well thought through but equally aren't sellable do you know what I mean it's really nice to see that that someone that post-pandemic everyone isn't there's at least one brand that isn't pushing this commerciality because obviously so many brands have lost out of money they're looking to push for to make money out of product left right and center so it's quite nice to see a brand that isn't too fussed about that clearly it, it, it's a secure brand in itself it doesn't need to worry about selling you know ample amounts of jumpers and, and trousers and pieces to make a turnover they can simply create use this season to add to their brand image to create this it's almost like a refresh in a way 
that this could be how they go on and move forward to working, which is strange when you look at their past seasons and then you see this. But I think in context, we'll look back and see this shift as quite a logical, like it's almost like future proofing, really, as we as most designers are moving towards a sustainable future or a, a responsible way, responsible ways of production. It's almost like future proofing the brand. Do you not think? I'm going to jump to if Patrick isn't too, is he still on the call? No, has anyone got any thoughts on the, sustain, on the sustainability angle of it? I was going to jump to Patrick because he's a sustainable designer, but I mean, both of you, do you, what do you think? Um, well, do you think just, it's important for a brand to be sustainable, to be future-proofed? I think, sure. I think absolutely. I mean, the world, the, the world, whole world's melting. I mean, we got to be sustainable. Come on now. But I do wonder, as a big brand that Marnie is, if we are going to be you know, future-proofing, being sustainable, doing a limited run of all these bespoke niche little artisanal moments, what does that turn into? Is that going to turn into, right, we've got this little patchwork daisy dress, are we going to churn out 9,000 and flog them around the world? Does, will that do the same thing? I don't know. I'm kind of curious to see where that will lead. Will it be sustainable? I don't know. Hmm. Eager to find out. I, will, I would like to think that they would perhaps move to a more like made to order basis in that people like, like they emphasize in this show, they dressed all these people and it was all very bespoke. It would be nice to sit to think that each and every piece that they sell going forward, obviously this isn't going to happen overnight, but it would be nice to think that they use this as a basis and then they, they worked from that. And then in a couple of years time, every piece that they sold was perhaps an individually handcrafted piece that was made for the wearer. That would be a nice way to move forward. And I know a lot of sustainable designers, um, young designers especially work in that way. So uh, perhaps, I mean, I don't know, would it be, do you think it's feasible for a large brand to shift? I, to that I don't know if that's plausible or feasible to do that. It's such a huge brand to do each piece made bespoke for the person and all that. I mean, it'd be fantastic to see that. I, I don't know what, what workforce you would need to make that happen. And I think you can do it if you do it like you only produce what people order. So you do like a pre-order basis. You can't obviously completely bespoke, no, but just making what people actually order is possible. You just have to re rearrange your like production and, and take more ownership over your production as well, which obviously brands are hesitant to do because then they're legally you know, they have legal implications with that, but um, it's it's certainly possible for sure. Yeah. So, speakers as uh, Marnie Patrick? Pardon? Is that, sorry? Would you, would you say that's possible for a brand as big as Marnie? Yeah, I think completely possible. It's just, I mean, it's what brands need to do now. You know, the, the biggest issue for me in fashion is that we produce what people we guess what people want and produce it before we know what they actually need and what was not need or want you know um if we can tackle that problem then we would immediately see a massive reduction in waste in the industry now you're back on like back online patrick i'm just going to quiz, quiz you a bit further on this i'm quite interested so how did you think were you quite pleased with how the collection was and did you think it was a good move to do all these bespoke upcycle pieces how do you think that sustainability will be incorporated in the brand of Marnie going forward. Yeah, I think it's um, it's really great. I think, you know, for me, it's always really important that fashion weeks and fashion things are, are a way to trial new ideas and like show, you know, possibilities. I don't think we have, they necessarily have to be fully formed, but to just propose and show something new. It's what we've always done with the show, right? It's always the new creative idea. But I think now part of that creativity is also about how you produce and consume the clothing itself. And um, so I could like really commend them for it because it's quite brave, like as you, you know, it's not so easy or so, um, you know, it's not like a fast sell. Um, so that, I guess that, I think it's quite brave. Is it? It's obviously, you know, I, I personally like things that are quite polished and shiny. So uh, even though it's not, my particular style I, I think it's really you know commendable um and I could also see lots of relations I, I read that he was born in on kind of lived on a boat and lived yeah. in Genova and Italy for a bit and all of that um the, the collection reminded me of that and like the childish nature of, of some of the the craft as well it just all felt quite like childlike which I personally really love and it feels quite nice to go to that after you know what if you've had quite a challenging period to then go back to something quite childish is quite refreshing for me. 
Yeah, no, I think that was quite interesting. Also, I, I'm going to touch now you've brought into play his um, background. I was quite interested to find out that he worked at Blue Marine and then Prada before being appointed in 2016 the creative director of Marnie. Um, and obviously, if you think about those brands and the aesthetics that come with those two brands, Prada and Blue Marine, they're very finessed, very kind of like feminine brands. Um, do you, it's quite interesting when you think about that and you think about what the, the collections that those brands are putting out and have put out in the past, especially under the, the, uh, the times that he was there. Um, do you think that, how do you see those two correlating? The, like the idea of him working there because he worked from uh, Blue Marine prior to 2008. He was appointed at Prada on women's wear and special from 2008 until 2016. So a long period, a long stint there um, and then was moved over to Marnie. Now, I mean, to me, for me, I think that's such a shift because especially when you look at this new collection that's very haphazardly thrown together which in all the in the best way possible, it's very creative, but it's nowhere near the aesthetic of Prada. Do you think this was just a case that he was fed up with that, like we said, polished image? Or do you think that it's just a natural tra transition, like I said, sign of the times? I'm sure he was itching to, to get out of it, doing all those you know, sleek lines and keeping it all together. But I, I don't, I mean, it's, it's a far throw from Prada, but I think the, it's, it's, it's chic, it's still chic and it's lovely and it's together. And I think you, you know, it's the Italian version of kind of craft. I think if the same thing were to happen in London, perhaps it would be even more disheveled and even more crazy. It's still extremely tasteful. And I think that is probably what the Pradaness is coming through for me. Uh, well, just out of interest, I love the word tasteful. What do you think was tasteful and distasteful about the collection? Because I mean, that's such a personal thing, the idea of taste. What, what I, think it, I think it's super tasteful, don't you think, with all the colours and, you know, all these like block stripes together with like the most perfect little raw edges. You know, it wasn't just absolutely smashed together. There's, there is finesse to this smashing. That's where the taste is. No, I agree. I agree. I think it was really well balanced in terms of colour. I, I mean, when you take apart the pieces, it lets, I mean, we'll dive into some of the pieces now. I think some of the menswear, uh, strangely, was some of the strongest pieces in there. Um, the women's bias cut dresses, I thought were beautiful. They had echoes of like, early Galliano with the slits in them um, and the way they fit, fitted the form. And also like um, some like mid 2000s, mid 2010s, um, like Versace dresses, you know, the ones with the slits and the pin, mm -hmm. um, which obviously a, a reference to the 90s Versace dresses but I mean you had that again with these but I mean for a bias cut dress they really did fit really quite well which shows that he can cut and I assume he, he like really well to a high standard which I assume which you don't always get I don't think with with people that do throw things together and are very crafty sometimes it can be a guise for their lack of skill but I think that if you really do look at the pieces themselves you can really see that he has an eye and a skill for these finesse pieces like the leather jackets themselves I think they are perhaps the most sellable pieces out of this collection but they're, they're so well done and so well balanced in terms of colour um, and accent and all, all of the different areas of the jacket are well balanced and it's not too cluttered with pockets and top stitching and massive patches left right and centre it's really well balanced and then you have that layered over these dresses which are perhaps more dishevelled and and I thought like like you said so I do agree I think it was quite in my opinion it was quite a tasteful collection but what did you think was distasteful out of it anyone including Harry did anyone did, did anyone did anyone hate anything at all was there a look that you like you thought this was a real big misstep or mm. no I think I think maybe like the um if there'd been a, I mean, I think this was the point, but also if there was a slight separation between like the environment and the clothes, it might have been easier to see the clothes. But of course, I was seeing it from a screen. So, um, I mean, that was my like screen opinion that I would have changed. But I didn't, I think all of it was, I mean, like you say, taste is subjective, but it all was definitely to a taste. It didn't seem like it was mixing between, it definitely seemed like it had one vision you know like one taste to it <laughs> do you think it was a well-considered collection 
I'm because I mean it was or do, like or do you think it was a very like last minute this is what we're going to do because I mean a lot of the pieces were hand painted uh, and obviously like I said handcrafted thrown together sort of things there were obviously uh, it was a mix of occasionally one look which was very haphazard and then one look which was much more refined and finessed in terms of its finish so do you think it was a collection that kind of just came together very quickly or because there isn't much information about how long they labored over this do you think it was something that was um thrown together in a, in a couple of weeks, as some brands do, or was it something that's been labored over for months? I imagine there's a Can lot of labor there, certainly. I don't think that was thrown together overnight. Um, even, you know, the, all those hand cut leather flowers that are all patched together into these little boxy dresses, that's time, yeah. that's consideration, that development. I think, all, I think it takes a long time to make things look like they were thrown together and haphazard falling off. I yeah. certainly think there's a lot of time behind all of this. No, I agree. I think that sometimes the most, uh, the most, some of the most thrown together looking pieces can take a long time to be because to be able to craft that in a way that looks, um, dis looks like it is dishevelled, but is in fact a full garment which is wearable and, and livable in, um, is quite a, a feat really. Um, so like I said, like going back to those bias cut dresses, the uh, slits on them are absolutely enormous. They could fall apart, but you know that when that little girl was walking in that dress, she's very secure and safe in that dress. It's not going to fall apart, but it's the illusion of that. Um, I mean, was there anything that you guys wanted to touch on or any standouts or anything that you wanted to bring to attention in terms of this collection that you think we haven't discussed? Mm. I mean, just to beat a dead horse, Jess Maybrook. I mean, I, it was the first point I made, and it's it's a it's a hill I'm willing to die on. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, uh, Jeannie, Patrick, any like overall overarching statements that you want to drop in here before we round this up? I think. Uh, oh no, you go first, Patrick. Sorry, the uh, I. It was kind of in the round, right? The show. And um, I've never personally been to a show that is like that, but I imagine it's also quite like another kind of interesting element of being there in person, that it's kind of, you're seeing the looks kind of in that kind of like circular motion. I don't, I, I feel like it probably adds quite a lot to it. Um, but, you know, like a, a, sh a theatre performance in the round is obviously so different to kind of like a traditional stage, so... I don't know, I just feel like it's worth mentioning because it seems to be like a different dynamic there that you're seeing the clothes in a different way. Oh. Jeannie, anything? I was going to say I really liked the hair and makeup. Yes. Um, no, we didn't touch on this. I was going to say And I was like, it's really, I thought it was really interesting and, you know, like super youthful. Yes, there were, I mean, the, that, I mean, this would be our closing, the closing, discussion but the hair was absolutely amazing especially some of those enormous blue um I, I, they weren't like mohawks but sort of mohawk kind of looks you know where they were standing up half a meter high i thought they were incredible um and like like we'd said earlier it's not something you na naturally see um in milan because it's it's normally such a refined finessed aesthetic that we see there so it was really nice to see this jarring individual that was very creative and almost um effervescent of London, like London creativity. Um, so, I mean, I will round up here. I've thoroughly enjoyed discussing it with all of you. My, I mean, I played devil, devil's advocate for a number of these questions, but I mean, my personal opinion, I think it was a really well-rounded, um, considered collection um, that really plays into the conversation of sustainability without feeling like a gimmick, um, which I think was really important. Um, so, yeah, I think we can round off with um, a well done to Francesco. Um, thank you to all my panelists and our studio audience. Thank you all for watching. Um, for exclusive fashion coverage, be sure to visit showstudio.com. And if you're watching via Show Studio's YouTube channel, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. <laughs>